this is Surya Sahan. Welcome to the Insurance Story Podcast, the platform to spread knowledge on insurance, innovation, digital disruptions, and entrepreneurship. Our website, insurancestory.com, and we are available on Spotify, Apple, Google, Audible, and Amazon Music. Today, we are going to discuss on the topic, cautious optimism in the era of digital and AI for insurance. And for now, I'm delighted to welcome our guest, Mitali Chatterjee, who is the Vice President at Swiss Re Institute, India. Her key focus areas include digital ecosystem, mental health, public sector solutions, electric vehicles, sustainability and decarbonization. She has over 11 years of experience in research and thought leadership and is a regular speaker at various industry and academic forums along with client events. Prior to joining Swiss Re, Mitali was a research specialist with Accenture. She has also worked at the Deloitte Center for Government Insights. In these roles, Mitali has authored several thought papers focusing on cross-cutting emerging technologies and their impact on the public sector. By education, Mitali is an economist with a master's degree from Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research. So Mitali, a warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Surya, and thank you for setting the tone with so much enthusiasm in your voice. Um, I'm sure, uh, uh, hopefully, nobody is going to fall asleep through the podcast. Well, yeah, thank you so much, and you know, great to have you on board with such a vast experience, especially from the research angle. It's always great to you know speak to thought leaders like yourself and focusing on a subject which is mutually so interesting and you know as we are passionate about which is insurance and technology and to discuss right away you know uh, on the topic uh, for today you know my first question to you is with rapid proliferation of digital technology and ai across industries what are some of the risks you foresee and how can insurers help in mitigating this risk and of course you know we believe as the technologies uh, you know comes up emerges with various aspects and parameters especially when we are in the era of generative AI, there are various foreseeable risks that we encounter. And of course, insurance as a, as a mitigating task force must have a solution to help the end users on how they can best protect and safeguard their uh, you know, interests from those risks. What's your take on this? Yeah, absolutely, Surya. I think you're spot on. Um, and, you know, I, I think uh, this question comes at a at a very opportune moment, I would say. Um, and I say this because uh, just a couple of weeks back, um, uh, we at Suzuri Institute published a study um, that looks at uh, the emerging AI risks across um, 10 different industries, both in the current decade as well as in the next decade. And um, in the study, what we've done is we've uh, we've analyzed the probability and severity of um, various um, AI related loss incidents due to things like um, data bias, uh, cyber attacks, uh, algorithmic and performance related risks, among others. And um, one of our key findings uh, in the study was that at present, uh, IT services uh, is the industry that is most impacted as a result of AI risks. Uh, and you know, you know, as they say, if you are a first mover advantage, you could also have the first movers disadvantage, which I think is the case uh, uh, for the IT industries. Um, but I think as we move ahead in the future decade, um, uh, the the risks uh, due to AI and uh, technologies uh, are going to be much more widespread across uh, various industries. And uh, the top three industries that could possibly see heightened AI risks include um, health, uh, mobility and transport, and um, energy and utilities. And um, I, I'm not going to delve into the details, but let me give you uh, the example of the health sector alone. Uh, you must be aware that health is um, increasingly uh, using AI in, in everything, uh, beginning from streamlining its administration um, to patient monitoring, uh, diagnosis, uh, treatment, uh, drug uh, development. And with increasing use of AI, uh, the, the consequences of something going wrong can be, can be pretty fatal. So, for example, if, if there's misdiagnosis due to a flawed or biased AI algorithm, then it could even lead to a loss of life. 
Uh, and you know, it's it's not just that the health industry um, alone uh, suffers as a result of these AI risks. Uh, there are ramifications for uh, the insurance and reinsurance industry as well, because this would mean that uh, things like um, medical malpractice, professional liability claims could cost the industry uh, billions of dollars. You know, you know things like uh, large language models, which are the buzzword uh, the, these days. Uh, they often tend to hallucinate. They tend to provide uh, seemingly comprehensive uh, answers on the surface, but uh, you know, when when you dig deeper, some of these uh, answers uh, kind of lack accuracy. And to top it all, there are a lot of uh, pending lawsuits over AI's denial of healthcare involving some of the biggest names in the industries like um, Humana and United Health. And regulators are also uh, imposing huge penalties over errors in claim processing uh, done by AI. But you know, I, I I don't want to make it sound like a gloom and doom story for uh, our uh, our listeners, because uh, there definitely are efficiency gains to be made uh, from AI. Uh, in fact, a recent study from NBER noted that there could be uh, almost five to ten percent uh, savings in the context of healthcare in the United States alone, and that translates into something like um, two hundred to three hundred fifty billion dollars. Uh, but the limited point that I'm trying to make is that you know the risks uh, and the opportunities uh, one of them cannot outweigh the other and you cannot have efficiency gains at the cost of you know rising healthcare uh, disparities i would say right right no, the, the the health sector as a whole the way they are actually you know trying to uh, implement emerging technologies and if you see in the indian landscape in particular how the insurance function actually works for the end users of course there's both pros and cons but if technology can really make it happen so that insurance can really you know foresee the future where claims can be processed fast fraudulent claims can be detected fast and of course the end users and at least in this sector are you know are the ones who are the really you know in a, in a big way would be the uh, uh, you know the benef beneficiaries in this, and this can really transform both industries together. I agree. I agree. That's true. And you know, my my, my following question to you, Mitali, is: Digital technologies, you know, throw open a world of opportunities as we see it, right? So, is mm -hmm. there something that can help to explore these opportunities? How do you see this, and where you see an insurance playing in this? Right. So I, I think that's a great question. And, um, you know, where, where there are risks, we say there are uh, opportunities as well. And a glass is never um, half empty. It can also be looked at as a glass half full. And, uh, you know, uh, insurers and reinsurers are actually in the business of risks. So uh, who better uh, than them to kind of uh, help out in uh, sort of looking at these uh, risks as, as opportunities? And on top of my mind, I think there are uh, I can give you three examples, uh, uh, live examples where insurers are uh, helping out, and I, I say that in the context of Swiss Re because you know I have a I have a better a narrower focus into uh, what Swiss Re is doing in this in this area. So uh, one thing insurers can do is they can provide uh, coverage for um, AI performance failures, one of the risks that I talked about earlier. And uh, in this regard, uh, Swiss Re is already partnering with Armila Insurance to sort of provide a warranty for their um, AI models. And this, this serves a dual purpose. Uh, so firstly, the vendors are able to sell their AI uh, with more confidence. And secondly, uh, buyers also have that peace of mind that in the event that the AI model fails, they can actually recoup their uh, investment. Uh, the second example that I can think of, uh, so a couple of years back, uh, Swiss Re um, partnered with the Monetary Authority of Singapore to develop something called the FEAT assessment methodology. FEAT standing for uh, fairness, ethics, accountability, and uh, transparency. And this was done in the context of uh, life insurance predictive underwriting. 
And the third example that I can think of, it's a pretty recent one. So Swiss Re has started um, offering a service known as Responsible AI for its um, clients in uh, Europe. And the purpose is to provide the clients with uh, some technical risk insights and expertise to uh, sort of help them uh, on their uh, responsible AI journey. But um, having said that, uh, you know, there, there are, of course, these risk solutions that the insurance and reinsurance industry can come up with, but they also have to be um, cognizant about the potential uh, vulnerability because uh, some of these AI risks, uh, they actually accumulate unseen uh, within the insurers portfolios. And, that, and that's something that um, we, are, we are coining as a uh, silent AI. Right, right interesting to learn of course the use cases uh, uh, you know something where large insurers are really focused on the uh, transparency and ethical aspect of utilization i think that's that's a really a big thing when it comes to emerging technologies like AI, because we are we are certainly you know uh, uh, forcing to how to apply it to the best of its ability but at the same time the compliance and of course the risk associated with such technology should, should also also be addressed and you know taken care of uh, simultaneously exactly so that's yeah. a very fair point made there with um you know uh, uh, moving ahead uh, my, my last question uh, to you is what does digital trust comprise of and can it be measured because you know we really talk about building trust and how much technology like a blockchain network or a dlt can really you know uh, help uh, building this but digital trust not really many people uh, understand or really or rather I would say uh, know how to relate to their day-to-day -day activities right and where exactly. it should be understood at the right place at the right time so what is your take on this mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, ironical that we are moving from one end of the spectrum to another. We were talking about uh, risks uh, in AI, but now we're moving towards um, uh, opportunities in AI and fairly so yeah. uh, because, uh, you know, digital uh, uh, AI, uh, internet, it's all pervasive. It's all around us. Uh, uh, it's beneficial to us as a customer. It's also beneficial to us um, as an in re as a reinsurance and insurance industry. But one thing that really helps to, you know, build um, uh, or, or close the gap, I would say, between the demand for digital technologies and the supply of digital technologies is this term uh, that you just use. It's, it's digital trust. And though it sounds very uh, simple, it is actually not. It's it's a fairly complex uh, concept, which is um, difficult to measure. Uh, it, it's not uh, it's not linear, right. and uh, it's also ironical because you know it's 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 slow to build, but it's very easy uh, to lose. So, uh, with that background, let me go back to your question on can digital trust be measured, and you know what are probably some of the uh, you know constituents of it. So, so we did try to look at it extensively uh, for a couple of years, and we built something called the digital trust uh, pyramid. Uh, so, let me break down the components of the digital trust pyramid. So, the base layer is is the layer of um, reliability, and this is about you know the access to internet, access to affordable internet at that, and also ease of use. Uh, sitting on top of this reliability layer is uh, a layer of security. And this is where we assume that, you know, access to digital is something that's already uh, sorted. It's, it's now a question of whether people feel safe and secure enough to exchange data and information uh, with third parties uh, and that too digitally. Um, and also it's about whether whether they feel protected against uh, theft and cyber attacks targeting their uh, personal and financial data. And finally, sitting on top of uh, these two layers of reliability and security is the third layer, which we call the zone of reassurance. And this is where we ask ourselves this question that are we comfortable in allowing digital technologies such as AI to take some of these decisions on our behalf or um, you know reach conclusions uh, autonomously and and what could possibly be some of those areas where artificial intelligence will always uh, 
need to be backed by human intelligence for reassurance because you know you want artificial intelligence but without backing human intel uh, backing of human intelligence it can sometimes be artificial stupidity um on the second part of your question regarding measurement of uh, digital trust uh, a couple of uh, studies have tried to measure digital trust and uh, we are one of them so we tried to break up the the notion of digital trust into its bare uh, into its two bare components one is the digital which is measured by the availability of digital infrastructure and the second part is the trust or what what we call the societal trust index which itself is um, you know comprised of four elements uh, it it is built using data on uh, trust in government trust in businesses um, trust in media and uh, in personal trust and when we built this uh, digital trust uh, score we found that uh, among we did this exercise uh, across countries about 80 to 90 countries and we found that uh, the scandinavian countries actually perform uh, the best when it comes to uh, digital trust scores and another interesting uh, you know uh, trivia i would like to throw in here is that you know we also uh, did a follow up uh, ensemble learning exercise and found that uh, these digital trust scores were actually extremely important in explaining uh, some of the um, insurance outcomes uh, you know uh, the traditional ones like uh, insurance penetration insurance density across countries and um, in some sense that's fairly intuitive as well right because only when we manage to establish digital trust, can we as insurers tap into um, the extremely uh, uh, useful resource of uh, data and access to consumer data with requisite permissions, of course, will help us to better understand and better price risk as well. And, and that's going to really help us um, you know uh, make the world a more uh, resilient place which is which is i think uh, uh, the key aim of uh, any uh, insurer or insurer right absolutely you know uh, if i have to really uh, sum it up when it comes to digital trust and i think one of the components you spoke about is on the trustworthiness and of course another component that comes up is on the cyber security part Right, so this both is like kind of you know how organizations can really prioritize on these factors to level up on their uh, digital trust aspect, and I I really how I see it is leaders really need to be uh, you know set clear their goals and perhaps uh, uh, you know foster a culture that would really support uh, digital trust within the company to act to exactly you know bring it to the external end users and you likely you know uh, said a couple of benefits uh, which is really uh, something that uh, uh, the industry should look at and when it comes to how you measure it i think these are the benefits really helps to identify the areas where which are really quantifiable and measurable and which would really help build uh, the digital trust aspect in this era of digital transformation and with that, Mithali, a fantastic discussion. And thank you for sharing your thoughts today. I truly like to have you as our guest. Thank you so much, Surya, for the invitation and to uh, give me the opportunity to share my uh, thoughts on your podcast. I think uh, what you're doing is a really brilliant way to sort of explore the um, intersections between uh, insurance and technology. So I, I am very happy to be here and I hope uh, you know, I wish you all the very best uh, for all the uh, future uh, talks that happen on your podcast. Uh, I, for one, will surely be listening. Thank you so much. So I, uh, you know, have that brilliant support. And thank you so much for being here uh, this afternoon. And lastly, to wrap this up, you are listening to the Insurance Show podcast and see you at our next episode. Till then, take care and stay safe. Goodbye for now.